Aloha, everyone, and welcome to another Tinker's Academy video. I'm your host, Kay Elmer, and today I've got a great pleasure to be doing an interview with Jim Gerard on the Biocharger NG. Uh, it is just going to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, if you haven't known who or you don't know who Jim Gerard is, uh, let me go ahead and I'll just do a quick intro and then Jim will bring you in. Uh, well, Jim is the original developer of what I would coin the phrase as a biophotonic multi-wave oscillator. And so he's got over 30 years of research uh, in a, you know, into energy and uh, energy devices and so forth. And he was the original person who decided that uh, he would uh, modernize the original Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator uh, way back. I guess you started to come up with the idea in the 80s, right? Uh, and then yes. released it in 93. And I think one of the most amazing things is just, you know, just you've been working on this thing for decades and there's this evolution of these devices. Uh, but one of the most interesting things about your background, Jim, is I guess in 1988, you know, you worked under Dr. Orville Fritz, uh, who was a protege of Nikola Tesla. Uh, and so I guess, you know, I mean, that would be just such an amazing opportunity. But to be able to study under uh, one of Tesla's uh, protégés, uh, is amazing uh, to even just hear. And I've got so many questions about that. But uh, but anyway, so you worked with him uh, uh, and for a while. Uh, and then that's and then after that, you came up with the idea for the first uh, version of the upgraded, you know, Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator. So we'll get into that in a second here. So now uh, currently, though, uh, as of 2013, uh, Jim is now the lead research and developer uh, for the Biocharger NG product that's now formed into a a bigger company, not just Jim by yourself, right? And uh, and so you're the lead developer there and and just doing some amazing work. So that's what we're going to be talking about, everybody, today. We're going to be talking about the biocharger, about how it became uh, into being, uh, and really just really looking at the biocharger from the standpoint of not so much, you know, um, uh, you know, like, you know, how it's being used, but like really how, how does it compare to all of the other devices out there in the bioelectrical magnetic space? Whether you're a biohacker uh, and you collect different devices and always are trying new things, or you're a wellness center, or you run a clinician, you're a clinician and you're running a center, uh, and you're looking for new ways to generate revenue for your for your business, uh, you know, it, that's what this conversation is going to be about. It's like, how does the biocharger fit into all of that? And how does it compare to all of the different devices that so many of us have? And and, you know, I'm as an avid biohacker for a couple of decades now, I, I have a ton of devices. I make videos on them. So we're going to be talking about that for, uh, from that aspect. But before I jump in, um, I do want to just do a quick disclaimer here. And, and the Biotarger NG is not a medical device and is not intended for use in the diagnosis of treatment or of disease or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment or prevention of disease or other conditions in man or other animals. So there you go. So anyway, welcome, Jim. Welcome to uh, to the interview. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, so I guess the first thing I really kind of wanted to share with people is, you know, this is what you've brought to the table. I mean, in, in so many of your other interviews, you, you make a comment about, hey, what would Lakovsky and Tesla and Reif, right? What would those gentlemen do if they had access to today's technology? And then that's where you, I, you know, I guess you just really, that's, that's pers the perspective in which you've developed, you know, the biocharger. So could you kind of just share with us, like, you know, like the evolution of it, in, you know, cause in a prior video, I kind of talked about like, you're the, you're the guy that came along literally 50, 60 years later, right after Lakovsky created the first multi-wave oscillator, which really introduced, uh, you know, just electrotherapy. I mean, it's one of the many devices of that era, but it's one of the ones that survived, right? I guess would be the best way to say it. But, you know, you've developed so many different versions and let's just talk about it. Let's start off with like, you know, how did you get the inspiration uh, to actually modify the the Lakovsky and start creating your own version? Yeah. So uh, uh, in the mid eighties, I came across the work of Nikola Tesla, uh, was very fascinated with the uh, you know, that world of possibility it really opened up my eyes. So at the time I had a, I was in a college and in high school and college had a landscaping company um, was my feeling was I was exposed to a bunch of the pesticides, herbicides, started coming down with the alopecia. So I went to an old um, uh, organic farm convention and believe it or not, that's where I first learned about Nikola Tesla. And uh, that started my journey down this road. And you know, throughout that that journey, I'd had many early mentors that uh, uh, helped me along that that path, and um, so I began experimenting with uh, Nikola Tesla's work in the 
you know, like I said, mid eighties and was building all sites, sorts of Tesla coils. I was building, uh, you know, conical coils, pancake coils, uh, double ended open coils, uh, uh, large ones that were shooting 10 footers. Um, and then about a year later, I came across the, uh, the secret of life by George Zahofsky. And, uh, that, uh, uh, got me curious about, you know, just that whole electro medicine. And, uh, so I built some based off of the earlier designs using the concentric rings and, uh, uh, you know, I had one setup that I was using with concentric ring. It was more of a weed out coil, not so much the Lahosky, where it was a, a, a double ended open coil where I had two antennas and then you'd sit in between that. And uh, it was really, um, really inspired me, uh, got me curious about it. So um, as I started to read more about this and, uh, you know, discovered it wasn't just Lukowski's work, but there was a bunch of other research that was out there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Royal Rife, but as well as, uh, you know, the Violet Ray machine. And as I started digging deeper, uh, I was at uh, Purdue University and uh, I found an electrical therapy, electrical therapy handbook of 1901, 1902. It was almost 2000 pages of different devices. And uh, so I, I took a lot of that research and saw that, you know, there was a light component, you know, so Lahosky's basic design was producing multiple wavelengths. So I wanted to introduce the visible light spectrum. So really my first claim to fame was the multi-gas tubes that uh, was added to a, a Tesla coil that I was using. Now I, I dropped one of the antennas, but sort of made it more like a campfire type of thing where multiple people could sit around. Um, and started uh, selling that version in 1993. It was uh, Bell's at the time. Um, so I sold quite a few of them. Actually had an interest of uh, uh, a venture capitalist. So we ended up uh, uh, renting a spectrum analyzer. And, um, it analyzed all these different devices I was experimenting with. And he was also working with the PEMF system with the Panos Pappas. So we were just really curious to understand what were the waveforms that were being generated. Um, so, uh, you know, began um, measuring these different devices that were out there and found that, uh, you know, especially with that spark gap design, it was really that spark gap that was creating the multiple wavelengths. So uh, by adding that visible light spectrum really expanded the whole field of it all. And, uh, you know, I, I, had a few ups and downs with it. Um, don't really want to get into too much of the, the story behind it, but uh, got a few patents that were on it. Uh, ended up, you know, giving it, giving that to, uh, uh, you know, to the business. Um, you know, we ended up going our separate ways. So I wanted to continue to evolve the system. And uh, about that time also, 1994, 1995 was the first Rife machine that I'd built. So I took a, a short wave uh, 1920s uh, vacuum tube crystal radio, 100 watt, and I modified it so I could do the pulse width modulation. I was using a function generator to you know, mimic uh, similar to what Rife was doing. Um, I really didn't see that as a, a viable market, but I was really very interested in the design. Part of the problem with what I saw at that earlier version of the Rife was it was uh, totally analog. So it was it took a little while to set each frequency and it would be very cumbersome to operate. So I really liked the, you know, that that design that we had, uh, you know, with the spark gap. And uh, but I wanted to continue to evolve it. And then in, I think it was about 2003, 2004, I came out with the advanced biocharger that uh, um, added a, a, a way of pulsing it a little bit. So I like that that idea of uh, being able to vary the uh, the output with it so you could pulse it off and on like a ripe machine. And then in 2012, I sort of made it uh, automated where I could, you know, I had it pulsed it three different frequencies. I could do uh, four Hertz. I could do 7.83 Hertz. I could do 20 Hertz, but I really saw that there was a big limitation on, 
really creating like a ripe machine. And that was mainly because with the spark gap design, you have a uh, you know, high voltage neon type transformer. And uh, as you pulse it at higher frequencies, you have these high stresis losses in the transformers and they would either burn up or wouldn't function properly across the spark gap, wouldn't give you the right voltage. So in about 2013, uh, I decided to do a vacuum tube. So I ended up doing a vacuum tube Tesla coil at that point, and that allowed me to do uh, modulation with it. And I sort of made it like a right machine. So I actually had an analog function generator attached to it and uh, uh, was about ready to release that. And uh, I drew some interest of a couple of uh, uh, people that wanted to invest into this. And uh, so um, we formed a company. They invested a couple million dollars into the company. They surrounded me a bunch of engineers and took my basic design. And as you alluded to earlier, we looked at it as, you know, what would Rife or Lahosky or these guys do in the 21st century uh, with this? Would they be using spark gap or a uh, vacuum tube, which is really 1890s, uh, 1920s technology? Um, and so we decided to, to make it solid state. And then, you know, we wanted to be able to, you know, control it and be able to program it, but not like an analog programming, but actually be able to create, you know, digitally these recipes of programs that would sequence through this. And then, uh, so with that concept in, in mind, we created the Biocharger NG. So, um, you know, one of the first things we ended up doing is again, running a, a or getting a spectrum analyzer. We had a third party spectral analysis to just really understand what we were doing with it. You know, we wanted to make sure we were producing those variable frequencies and harmonics. Um, and, and we were very excited when we saw the spectral analysis that we received that uh, variable frequencies and harmonics. Even, even more exciting was, uh, you know, we theoretically predicted what those harmonics would be produced. And they actually, you know, we confirmed that with 30, uh, um, third party spectral analysis. So. Now we had this platform called Biocharger NG, and, and in 2015 we start selling our first version, and or, I mean the the first one, and you know since then I think we've sold almost 3,000 systems worldwide in 48 countries now. So that's, remarkable. that's sort of the evolution yeah. behind you know the thought process, but we really wanted to combine a lot of these different works, you know, mm -hmm. and as I started to understand exactly what we were doing. I saw these different fields that we were also producing with it. So we had this electric field, we have a magnetic field, we have this variable frequencies and harmonics and we have light, you know, so we're sort of bringing together many of these different technologies that are out there. Some of that PEMF systems that, you know, that's one of the beauties of a Tesla coil is you have this uh, PEMF component, you know, similar to some of those high energy PEMF systems that are out there. Uh, but we also had that high voltage electric field that, you know, you don't really get with the right machine. Right. Yeah. That's kind of, that's, that's what really drew my interest to the biocharger when I first heard about it was because, you know, you were the, are literally the first person I've seen and I've been doing, been following this stuff for you know a while that's actually was successfully able to combine some of these different modalities and some of these different technologies. Cause I know for a fact, you can't play, rife through a multi-wave oscillator you know a Lakovsky because the spark gap is throwing off right as you mentioned all these different frequencies and how do you isolate a specific frequency you're trying to target when you've got just this shotgun blast of other frequencies coming through which has its own merit right but you know they're so separate in terms of how they approach uh, you know the effect that you want to get out of them that you know but you were able to to you know figure that out which is just amazing so I've got so many I've got so many questions about each one of these individual things, but let, let's get into just just an overall picture of it. So, like, what you know, what's your elevator pitch right now for like what is the biochar? You know, when people meet you and like, what does the biocharger do? They see this big thing sitting on a table, and and the, and it just it's, it looks amazing and super high tech. And so, how do you explain like, oh, what does that do? You know, in terms of uh, you know, like, it's, what is its key features? Yeah. So one of the neat things is you have this electric field that also has this right. high voltage okay. component to it. So unlike a ripe machine, you don't really have that high voltage component. And mm -hmm. we have that PEMF or the magnetic field around the base. 
you know, which is really inherent with, you know, a typical Lukoski machine and uh, variable frequencies and harmonics. Now, um, you know, Rife wasn't really just producing one specific frequency. He did have that right. shotgun as far as a wide spectrum of frequencies. But what, what was neat about that is as you modulated it, different frequencies, you would generate unique sets of hundreds of thousands of harmonics. So in my opinion, I think that Rife machines were really more of a multi-wave oscillator than a multi-wave oscillator is oh, because okay. typically with the multi-wave oscillator, you only get those one sets of harmonics. So, um, and then we have that light component and what's neat is each one has its own unique benefit to it. You know, that high voltage electric field. So one of the things that, uh, um, you know, there's quite a bit of research in this whole field of uh, electroporation, they call it. So the idea of, um, with the electric field, you could actually um, stress the cell membrane like a dielectric. So the principle behind it is, you know, in healthy cellular function, you have these positive negative charges surrounding the cell membrane. These positive negative charges, when they're sufficient enough, they'll trigger ion channels. It could be the sodium potassium pump, ATP, mitochondrial function, it could be the uptake of hormones, proteins, nutrients. And there's also this detoxification effect. So you're dealing with that fermentation of the cell in, in the nucleus of the cell, all that uh, chemistry that's going on. You have to deal with some of that waste product. Now, as we age, that resting membrane potential drops, and its ability to trigger these healthy cellular functions diminish. So there's a significant amount of research that points that when you uh, create a high voltage electric field, you could stress that cell membrane like a dielectric to trigger that healthy uh, cellular function, to trigger you know the uptake of nutrients and detoxification. Um, now there's another side of it, which is the PEMF so side of it, or what I consider more the magnetic field. So, um, you know, magnetic fields work a little differently than the electric fields by um, affecting the ion charges. So the magnetic field can't really stress the cell membrane like an insulator or dielectric but what it does is it affects the positive and negative charges. So as they're moving around in our body in the presence of a magnetic field, it picks up those that electric charge to increase the charge potential to again, that trigger healthy cellular function. And so they both sort of do the same thing, but in different ways. One does it by the, uh, the voltage by affecting the cell membrane itself to make it more uh, porous. And then the magnetic field works with those ion charges as they're moving around. But the net effect is still both the uh, um, uptake of nutrients and detoxification. Okay. Um, thirdly, we have these uh, uh, radio frequencies and harmonics. So whether it's a Wright machine or Lahovsky's system, you know, the idea in Lahovsky's theories is that uh, you know, cells are like these one band radio receivers they are tuned to a specific frequency. And it isn't just like this hippy dippy concept that cells are vibrating, but there's a, a lot of science behind it. So if you ever had a, say for instance, an MRI, the MRI is based off of a principle called magnetic resonance. So the principle behind magnetic resonance is each cell, each molecule, atoms, absorb and emit specific frequencies unique to itself you can actually identify that uh, uh, type of cell or a, a molecule based off of that waveform. So what Rife actually discovered and what we see subsequently with MRIs is, you know, the, they absorb and emit specific frequencies unique to itself. So when you generate that right radio station, you can actually stimulate specific um molecules or cells or even atoms. So um, part of what we do with the recipes of programs is we're producing these variable frequencies and harmonics. So uh, in the field of what they call magnetic resonance spectrum, as well as the molecular, molecular band spectrum, that covers the entirety from zero to visible light. So by varying these uh, frequencies and harmonics, that's how you can become uh, resonate molecules as well as uh, uh, e even cells. So we wanted, you know, with what we created, we're able to create those variable frequencies and harmonics. And how we do that is very similar to what Rife 
had discovered. So what Rife had discovered was uh, as you take a carrier wave and you mo modulate it, you generate these sideband harmonics. And as you change those, you generate different sets of harmonies or harmonics. And I like to compare it to like in music. So if you have two different notes, you can generate a harmony or harmonic. If you change one of those notes, you can generate different harmonies or harmonics. So by creating these different pulse frequencies, and we can pulse it, the biocharger up to 50,000 hertz, which is that range that Rife was working with, you can now target for particular outcomes. And if you understand how, uh, you know, where you want to target a specific frequency, now I can, you know, pulse it as specific frequencies that could generate a particular harmonic that could generate a specific cell molecule that we want to target with it, which is really the, the essence of what RIPE was working with. So, um, you know, as part of the biocharger, we have these recipes or programs, and I think we're up to about 1,500 of them. We could generate these uh, uh, different recipes or programs to target for particular outcomes. So the and then finally, we have that visible light component. And our light's a little bit different than you know some of the more uh, specific wavelengths that they target, but we wanted to be more of that broader spectrum. So the broader spectrum, we have uh, various noble and inert gases that we're producing about a thousand different wavelengths in the infrared, far infrared, near infrared, visible light spectrum. Mm -hmm. So what we're really trying to do in essence is um, mimic nature. And that's really what I think Tesla was all about was mimicking nature. And what, uh, what do I mean by that is the lightning discharge. So um, you know, most people may not realize it, but we have 8 million lightning strikes approximately every day. It's about hundred every second. And each one's generating unique sets of hundreds of thousands of harmonics. Now, every other planet's doing the same thing. The sun, what we call solar flares, solar storms are really nothing but this atmospheric discharge that contributes to what we call cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is mimic what's going on in nature by uh, you know, generating these variable frequencies and harmonics through uh, plasma discharge. But we're actually not quite as nature because we could be very um, specific on the harmonics that we want to generate with it by the way in which we modulate it. Okay, that yeah. Sense. Yeah. That, and, then, it, and then finally, uh, we have, a, you know, that visible light component. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, there's just was so much research in the field of even light therapy, infrared, far infrared. Uh, visible light spectrum. So that was really the essence of what, how we pulled it all together. And, you know, when you look at the, you know, the spectrums of frequencies that we're, we're covering, we're, pre we're pretty much covering the entire from zero to visible light. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing. You got all that in one device. I, I'm just, it's mind blowing. So I, I guess my question is, is like, you know, you're doing so many different things at the same time with one device, but so are you saying that the biocharger then modifies its output based on a specific recipe. So like, let's say you don't turn on any recipes and you just turn the unit on, right? Is it going to just produce, uh, uh, you know, electromagnetic field and, and, and then the harmonics from that field because of the Tesla coil itself and you're emulating a spark gap with solid state technology? And then if you did run pr uh, the recipes, then the machine starts to modulate the different, uh, you know, voltage uh, and magnetic field and so forth per recipe. Or is it like the machine just runs and then you turn on a recipe and it runs based on how, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure how to form, you know, frame the question, but you've got all these different modalities in one device. And I'm just wondering, does the machine ad adjust every single time you run a recipe so that it's only playing that recipe the way the recipe or, you know, that frequency set supposed to have been played? Is that how that yes, works? Yes, it's only just, uh, it, you play oh, just okay. a recipe. Each one is a has a specific outcome with it. I mean, sometimes okay. we can mimic, you know, more of a, uh, you know, I, I look at the, the biochargers like a, um, an infinite number of, or infinite number of possibilities of multi-wave oscillators. So, you know, typically if you wanted to generate a, a new set of harmonics with the multi-wave oscillator, you would have to change the length of the secondary coil. You'd have to change the tuning in the primary coil, the capacitance. So it's it was a very awkward way of doing it. So the way, you know, every recipe, every, you know, you can't really run the biocharger without running a recipe. 
And part of that recipe is pulsing it or modulating it at specific frequencies. And sometimes it could be a random event, you know, where you're not really targeting anything specific, but you're still just changing. So every second you could generate a, a unique set of hundreds of thousands of harmonics. And it could be more of a random event versus you could be more specifically targeted. So sometimes like with our recipes or programs, we'll uh, uh, slightly change the pulse frequency. So when you slightly change the pulse frequency, you slightly change the harmonics that are generated. So when you look at it over time or you look at spectral analysis wise, those harmonics are very closely together. So you would see like clusters uh, over time those harmonics that you're working with, but they wouldn't vary that much with it. And then there's uh, more of that random event where you're just um, changing it. You know, you know, sometimes we may change it by, you know, 10 Hertz at a time or hundred Hertz at a time, depending on the, the recipe or program. And when you do that and you sweep it, you know, so it, at that mode, you're almost mimicking the, uh, the, the, uh, I can't think of what his name is. So, uh, Hoyland, Philip Hoyland, that was working with Royal Rife. So when you look at Rife's versions, he had he had the the first version was he would be more targeted. So that was he would pulse at a specific frequency, and then he found that if you do narrow sweeps around a, a specific frequency, you would have a better effect. And then Hoyland said, you know, you don't need to even be targeted. You could be more of a random. So he would sweep between, you know. 550,000 Hertz is how he was originally working it with. Um, and then that was more of a random event. So you didn't really have to target it. So, you know, depending on how we create our recipes or programs, we'll, we'll determine how we're doing that. So sometimes we may be more random with it. You know, sometimes we create recipes or programs that are, um, you know, more of like sound therapy or things like that. So you, mm -hmm. you generate specific uh, pulse frequencies that would be, uh, you know, more on the like Fibonacci sequence or something like that, or uh, uh, Sofeggio frequencies. Um, but then, you know, with the, you know, uh, other recipes are more mathematically driven, um, like that Fibonacci is, I, I misspoke on that, but the Fibonacci sequence would be more. So when we pulse the frequencies, we would pulse it with Fibonacci numbers. So there would be more of a mathematical relationship that you know goes along with it. So there were different ways that we created different ways to generate our programs. And the other thing that was really neat is, you know, we get feedback from other practitioners that are out there that have had other frequency devices that like specific frequencies. So they would help to collaborate some of the recipes of programs. And what was really neat is, you know, the bio and biocharger NG is really more of a platform. So yeah. you know, part of what you do is you, you connect to the, uh, you don't have to run it to be connected to the internet, but um, you know, as we make new recipes or programs, it's available to your biocharger, you know, so we have the, what we call this my cloud and it, within our my cloud, we have these, 1500 recipes or programs that are on there you can access with your computer and then you can the biocharger itself holds about 30 to 40 recipes depending on how long those recipes are um that uh you can move those back and forth so it was sort of that uh, 21st century twist that we were i was talking about a little bit earlier we wanted to be able to you know, build this as a platform to where you can program it. So you know, when we first uh, started selling the biocharger, we had 10 recipes and we were thinking, well, if we got the 100 recipes, that would just be awesome. And, you know, that continued to grow and grow and grow. And what was, what's really neat about that is that first biocharger we sold in 2015 has the exact same capability and it has the exact same access to those recipes as the one that's rolled off the shelf now. So, we wanted to build it more as a platform so we didn't, you know, obsolete the system in five years to have a new system. And, you know, the other thing that was really neat is, you know, we have this, uh, you know, because it's digitally uh, driven and it's this platform, you know, we've changed the uh, interface and the way it works, works and, you know, the way you access the MyCloud, you know, we have like Google searchable terms so you can search for specific outcomes you want to look for and it'll list out the different recipes or programs that are available 
that then you could move over. You could see what the recipes were designed for. Um, you know, what we uh, intentionally wanted to target with it, um, uh, the history behind it, whether it was, you know, pr practitioner driven, we could even make them uh, private recipes or programs. And, you know, we're in many uh, locations and, you know, a lot of them have uh, franchise. So we have custom recipes for these specific franchises and things like that, that, uh, you know, that have biochargers that are included with it that would be more branding towards them. So for instance, uh, Osteo Strong is a, a company or a franchise company that I think they have like 150 locations and we're almost in all those. And we had custom branded recipes that were targeted for the Osteo Strong group. Oh, so yeah. that was part of that our intention sense. that we created with it, that we could, you know, enhance this uh, ability over time. And then, you know, we're even continued to build out on that whole process. So, um, you know, not only being able to search for specific recipes, but what other recipes would be good for. So we're building out, uh, you know, our uh, ways in which you could create what we call recipe plans and things. So that's some of the things that we have in the works that we're building out. Um, and, and, and as part of, you know, what we have with the biocharger, we have an outstanding, um, support team and then an advanced training and part of that in advanced training we work with the uh, a nurse practitioner who's had the biocharger originally and was really good at using the biocharger and approaching it from a functional approach so for instance if you had uh, acne or something like that it may not just be acne it's the issue or skin that's the issue but it could be like liver kidney so right part of her work was we were you know building out different recipe programs. So we're actually now taking her skills and then putting that into our, uh, uh, you know, advanced systems that we're building out within the MyCloud that now you, you, will, you will be able to search a recipe and then it'll give you other recipes to choose from. Or if you have, you know, if you're in like a gym or something like that and you have like a, a, a set of, you know, an outcome that you want to do and you want to give them like a, 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 a recipe plan as you will, then, you know, for the practitioner, they would have like this recipe plan that they would follow up, follow, but that's part of, you know, what we build out into it. So it isn't just this, you know, simple system, but, you know, there's a lot of thought behind it. And there was also, you know, some foresight that we had into it. So for instance, in the back, we also are able to do audio modulation. So, I don't know if anyone have ever seen like the singing Tesla coil type system. So, you know, the old spark gap design, you hear that hissing sound. Whereas with the biocharger, it, it produces different tones. So um, by adding this audio component and, uh, you know, audio modulation on the duty cycle, we could actually literally play music off the top of it if we want, or you could add different tones or frequencies to it to create more harmonics. So, you know, we, we tried to build things out and that's all built into that first 2015 system. So, um, you know, even though we haven't released the audio modulation part to the public, you know, and we're building out our software to help manage, you know, running that, you know, we had the, the foresight to try to include as many things as possible that we wanted to include into the biocharger. You know, you hit on a really important point, and that's every device I've ever purchased usually comes with a, a book, if if that, um, maybe a tutorial if you're lucky, uh, and a steep learning curve. And, you know, and I've looked at uh, what you guys are doing, and you've got this incredible big, uh, you know, tutorial base, plus you've got the consultants. And yeah, that's that's the smartest move I could ever imagine somebody doing is having a person just work with somebody that says, oh, you got acne, but, you know, it's not just run the acne frequency, you know, which is your typical rife response, right? You go buy a rife machine, you look in the book, says acne, <laughs> and you run that frequency, but it may not even be acne. And having that consultant and having the recipes is, that's brilliant. I mean, that's pretty cool. So, you know, let me ask you, though. So 
I guess from the from the average person who's not used to high voltage devices, I guess one of the first things I want to just kind of talk about is that is you're put you're producing this really strong electromagnetic field in somebody's home or in their office, right? So, what's your response to the uh, to the question? Is like, wow, you know, when I look at the specifications and I see that the voltage putting out, you know, the machine's putting out up to six hundred thousand, you know, six hundred kilovolts or six hundred thousand volts, and you know, how is that a safe thing for people? And, and, and what are the precautions that come around having that strong of an electromagnetic device inside your, your office or home? Yeah, yeah. So obviously you wouldn't want to grab. So we have, if you notice at the very top of arc rod, it's where the spark would be emulating. But one of the neat things about the biochargers, is you can take that arc rod off. So one of the drawbacks that we oh. always saw with the multi-wave oscillators systems is they were too noisy to really operate in a professional oh, yeah. setting. Other drawbacks also were the ozone that was generated as well yep, as yep. the uh, 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 adjustment of the spark cap. So um, you, you have to have some precaution in and around the toroid. And, you know, so that's part of the reason why we have that enclosure that's around the top of it to keep people from actually physically touching the toroid. Right. Now they could, if they really wanted to reach up and talk, touch the top of it, but we have many safety uh, signs and things like that, you know, so part of what, um, and it's unusual compared to these, you know, many of these other, especially the multi-wave oscillator type of devices is we have our CE markings. And, you know, so part of that CE markings, if you go through our booklet and things, you know, there's that cir circle of safety that you have and, you know, you have to have uh, th the right markings that are on it. So, it, it, you know, you, you become very comfortable with it and yeah. you're really just so, more or less sitting around it like a campfire. So there isn't any mm -hmm. need to physically touch it because of the type of field that we're generating with it. Um, so right away, people at first they become, you know, when they first turn it on, they're like, wow. And it, but, you know, right. It, you know, once you get comfortable with it, you know, people are totally fine. And that, you know, that 600,000 volts sounds very high, but if you look at some of the uh, the original multi-wave oscillators, they were operating, you know, well within the, those ranges as far as the voltage output. So, um, and they had those rings wide open. But you know, one thing that's relatively safe about it, it, it you know, like any multi-wave oscillator or Tesla coil, if you get hit by one of those sparks, you know, it may startle you a little yeah. bit, but it's not really going to hurt you. Yeah, um, yeah, I've, yeah. You know, we don't ever recommend you doing that. One thing yeah. it will do is if you try to arc it near the enclosure, it'll mark up the enclosure more than anything else. And that's the thing we don't really want to, you know, it's more of a cosmetic thing than it is anything else with the markings that are on it. And one thing it's, you know, the other thing is part of our CE markings is, you know, we had to make it out of special material, you know, so it has to be certain fire rated material. So if, if in case for whatever reason, it becomes an arc on there and you, you, you get something that starts to, to burn on the plastic or something like that, you know, not that we ever have that issue, but uh, we wanted to make sure we use the right materials that, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, safe. It's not going to transfer flame and, you know, burn up or anything else like that. So we wanted to make sure we have that. That's part of the reason why we have that emergency stop that's on there. Uh, we have certain filters are on it too. So one of the other issues that you typically have with the multi-wave oscillators is uh, you get a lot of noise being fed back into the power line. So one of the uh, part of our requirements that we also had, you know, as part of our CE markings is we had to have certain filters on the power line to filter out all that stuff that uh, we're not feeding anything necessarily back into the power line that would, uh, you know, create noise in, into the system that would, you know, transfer and interference and, you know, communication phones and things like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the things, too. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had a Likoski multi-wave oscillator. I've actually got a I actually have a Bell's knockoff right now uh, that I got a few months ago. I've also got like a single antenna one. And I can't you know, I mean, just like you, I've been zapped so many times. Uh, but, you know, looking at the biocharger from your description, it just seems to me the most literally the safest device i've seen i actually saw one of your uh, new testimonial video came out for the biocharger today and i saw that that center uh had a, a, pe a plexiglass covering for that little arc rod 
so that even yes. so that you know so no no curious customer or client could go hey what's that and touch it with their finger they actually had it enclosed so i thought that was like okay that's pretty smart because you, you definitely don't want to touch it uh but okay yeah, that so that was also I, yeah. more of a a, a noise dampener yeah. you know so yeah yeah people still love to see that spark you know sometimes when you see a tesla oh, yeah. coil and you don't have an arc rod on there you're yeah. thinking, you know, it just looks more like a lamp or something like that. Or the Tesla yeah. enthusiasts are like, uh, there's no, there's no output to it. But no, uh, no, no, yeah. Really, what happens is the energy <laughs> stored on the toroid, and you know, you can run it with or without the arc rod in there. We have like a, a, a nylon plug that we can put into the top of it, so where it's totally quiet. All you hear is uh, maybe a slight uh, noise from the fans and things like that, but it's. Uh, uh, that was one of the other things that we you know, really wanted to build into that system. So you 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 can really use it in that professional setting without having to listen to that noise all day long. So you, you can imagine having a multi-wave oscillator running in the office. Uh, yeah. You know, the people working in the office would get really tired very fast with that, uh, as well as with all that ozone and stuff like that that's generated. So one of the things that we thought was really neat was, you know, part of that spectral analysis, we looked at it from with the arc rod and without the arc rod, you know, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, we're still producing that same voltage output, which we oh, are, okay. we're still producing the same PEMF, uh -huh. we're still producing the exact same variable frequencies and harmonics, I mean, you still have that same light component, you know, you may not get a uh, you know, and with the solid state version, you don't really generate as much ozone. So even if you have that arc rod in there and you see yeah. that corona discharge, it's not nearly as much ozone as what you would typically see with the, uh, uh, you know, with the multi-wave oscillators, especially ones with the larger corona discharge with it, uh, but still have that voltage component, which is something that we really did want to lose when we went to this solid state version with it. No, that's really smart. I mean, uh, you know, my uh, Lakovsky rep, I had a replica of it, dual antenna, and I had to keep the fans on just to oh, yeah. dissipate the ozone when using it. Plus, you know, the, the, you know, the antennas are right out there and you'd bump against one and it hurt. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then the, you know, the, I think the other issue too, is just keeping it safe. Yeah. And, but it is, I just wanted to stipulate that anyone that's never experienced one of these devices uh, it is really safe to be in a high voltage field. I mean, just being in the field is, you know, it's perfectly fine. Uh, and then of course the issue here is touching it in the ozone. So it seems like you've really, you know, kind of, you know, solved those problems. So the other, the other question I had about the, uh, cause you made a comment, I think in a video with Luke's story about that you controlled the duty cycle. Um, and, uh, and, and so could you kind of explain, like, what does that mean? Uh, you know, like in terms of the, how the device runs as to the duty cycle and the waveforms coming out of the of the sure. device. Yeah. So um, uh, with any any recipe, we're pulsing it at specific frequencies. So what, what I mean by pulsing it is we're literally turning off and on the radio transmitter at certain frequencies. So you may be turning it off at, uh, say, 10 hertz. So that means that you're literally turning it off and on 10 times a second. Now, the duty cycle, what you're varying is the difference between the off and on cycles. So, for instance, if it was 50% duty cycle, it would be equally off on um, for the, so at 10 times per second, you're turning your, uh, each off on is one tenth of a second. So, it could be on for 50% of that one tenth of a second, and then it would be off for 50%. Now, if you did it at 10% 10 10 duty cycle, it would only be on for that one tenth of a second uh, for, uh, you know, 10% of that time. And then it would be off for 90% of the time or vice versa, vice versa, vice versa. It would be 90%. So if you had a 90% duty cycle and part of the reason why we do that is as you pulse it at higher frequencies, there is more of a, a randomness that's happening. So if you're pulsing it off and on at say 50,000 Hertz, you could be pulsing it on it, you know, because you're producing a sine wave as that carrier wave. You could be at that zero point at the, you know, if the duty cycle is too short and it wouldn't really, you don't see much of a corona discharge. You're not really seeing much action mm -hmm. from the uh, uh, magnetic field. So you, we would increase the duty cycle higher to allows you to be on longer period of time to catch more of that full part of that waveform versus uh 
um, you know, when it's you know it's lower duty cycle, what'll happen is you 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 would you there's a good chance that you would be at that low point. In other words, so okay. we also wanted to have that part of that variability with the duty cycle. That's where we added the audio modulation. So what we're able to do is uh, vary the duty cycle by um, audio tone. So by doing that, you can, uh, you know, that's really, you can literally play music from that by doing that. Now it may sound a little choppy, you know, almost, you know, when, when you run it, it sounds like uh, an AM radio played really loudly. You may have that little hissing sound from it, but you clearly, you know, if you, if you listen to the music, you can clearly hear all the instruments playing. You can recognize all that's Tom Petty, for instance, if you wanted to play Tom Petty through it, you know, uh, Bruce Springsteen, you can, you, you can play uh, Mozart through it. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways you can, you know, work that duty cycle. Plus you can pulse it. I mean, uh, you can run a duty cycle of different uh, with the audio. You can literally uh, play a specific tone with it. And when you do that, you get more, uh, hedrodyning is more as harmonics that you can generate with it. So there's a lot of different uh, benefits within that duty cycle that you can add another dimension of uh, ways to generate more harmonics with it. Is that something that the user controls or is that kind of built into the recipe so that the recipe tunes it for well, that you? Would actually work you don't have to learn part, it. Yeah, that would be part of the recipe oh, Okay, yeah. Uh, that would be created. We haven't built that part all out yet. But, you know, the way the way I use it right now is we have like a, a Bluetooth receiver that you could hook up to your phone, for instance, that okay. uh, we have an optical port in the back that feeds the uh, the duty cycle. So you're now you're varying the duty cycle up and down to music is what you're doing. Yeah. And I, it, the first time I heard it, I was just completely blown away, you know, literally hearing, you know, Mozart coming off the top of it. And and part of the way we have the recipes, we are still pulsing it, you know, so we really believe that pulsing is really an important part of it, you know, because that's really what nature is all about is, you know, it's pulsing off and on. Uh -huh. If you have that continuous wave, you can make the music clear, but you're really losing that benefit that you would be getting with the, uh, uh, you know, that pulsing event. So we wanted to be more of that pulsing effect versus, uh, you know, the other part. And, it, you know, one of the quotes that Nikola Tesla famously, you know, talk talks about is, you know, in lightning, he hears it's like a symphony to him, you know, so, you know, literally now becomes more of a symphony, you know, just not just a, a note now, you know, uh -huh. when you play music throughout it, now it becomes almost more like a symphony. So you're literally bringing to light what Tesla was talking about yeah. as, you know, lightning playing music. Right, which is nature. <laughs> So, okay, so then, you know, you mentioned waveforms. And so there's lots of different, uh, you know, devices out there and they all have different waveforms. And so you know, there's the issue of longitudinal versus transverse. And then there's the type of wave. So could you kind of, does your, uh, does the biocharger put out, put out different waveforms based on recipes? Or yeah, is so it, the, always, oh, okay. Well, there's, yeah. well, there's that, a, that a type of waveform, which is the, the, uh, square wave so we're you know with a typical ripe machine it's more of a a square wave off on type of thing but within that there are you know frequencies and harmonics that span am fm short wave long wave uhf vhf microwave millimeter that's part of those hundreds of thousands of harmonics that you're generating with the 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 waveform so there's multiple different types i look at more of it's a complex waveform that you're generating with it so mm -hmm. you have your carrier wave you have your harmonics that you're generating you have your sub harmonics that you're generating but overall it's like a a, a, a pulse sine wave is what you're okay. ultimately doing but within that pulsing is the pulsing is really what's generating the the harmonics with it okay so more of a pulse sine wave but you yes. mentioned pulse sine wave and then square wave. So is it a combination of the two and it's just running? Well, pulsing means it's, it's a square wave. It's an off on oh, okay. type of thing. So it's a squ okay. square wave meaning you have off on, off on. But uh, okay. within that square wave, you can generate the harmonics with it. And oh, okay. in reality, oh, oh, that's okay. really what's happening like with the multi-wave oscillator. But the the issue, what happens with the multi-wave oscillator is you have that pulsing from the spark gap. So there are periods of time where it's off on. 
but that's driven by that 60 hertz. So there's a 60 hertz component of that off on that's being generated with it that creates the harmonics that you see with it. Now, for instance, if you take a, a multi-wave oscillator and go to 50 hertz versus 60 hertz, you with the same setup, you'd have to tune it a little bit differently, but you would still generate the uh, different harmonics just because of the wave, you know, the way in which the 50 hertz versus 60 hertz. What we found is, you know, the way in which we do the biocharger, and part of our intellectual property we built into the biochargers on the primary side, you know, we have a, it's a pure DC. So we we developed, a, you know, some proprietary ways of generating oh, pure okay. DC that we're chopping up to be whatever we want it to be as far as that side wave and, uh, or I mean, that, uh, that square wave that we're doing with it. Okay. No, off that's on part of it. No, that's fascinating. Okay. No, no, that makes sense. All right. So let me kind of talk about uh, how the biocharger compares to other things. Uh, you know, a great description up to this point. I, I, you know, it really helps me understand it better. So um, I grabbed this uh, diagram off of a lecture that Aaron, Mir Aaron Murakami made over at Vril. He did this lecture and video um, where he basically was comparing the Tesla um, multi-wave oscillator. There's really, I don't know, there's not really a name of that device, you know, that, that, that old story, you know, of, of Tesla and his friend, uh, Samuel Clemens came in and played with one of his machines and that's what got him into the whole, you know, health thing. Um, but, uh, you know, so in the diagram, I mean, Aaron kind of just put in these golden mean antennas, but I don't, I don't really know what antennas they actually use. I'm thinking, you know, it could be anything because of Tesla, but the Lakovsky definitely used golden mean antennas. So I got three questions and you already addressed the first one, which was frequencies. So, um, you know, the spark gap, uh, is producing the majority of the frequencies, although, uh, to like, let's say Bob Beck kind of claimed that, you know, the capacitance between the rings also produce frequencies, but not as much as the spark gap, but would that be correct in terms of just, yes. The and, and actually the way Bob Beck had his set up is he had the ground in the middle of it. So you right, ever seen some of those right earlier here. versions that would spark between the the rings that he would have in there, but right. the original multi-wave oscillator really did not have that. Now, one of the things is you're shown in the diagram on the left is you have really on the, the left part of the coil is really, really the transmitter side. And then the other side is more of a receiver side of it. So yeah. there is that second coil that's on the right, isn't really connected to anything, but it's really acting more as that antenna receiver yep. that you would uh, typically see like with the, a radio transmitter receiver type. Now the picture you have on the right, which you call the Tesla multi-wave oscillator, I would con consider more of that the the weed out. Uh, it's spelled O U D I N type of coil. So if you notice on that one, you have that primary is more in the middle of it, and really the with that one, I consider that one, and it's you would you don't really necessarily see it with this diagram, but typically what they would have is they would have the secondary coil more horizontal, not vertical. And then what they would do is they would put the primary in the middle of it. So it would act like two coils that were out of phase with each other. Oh, okay. that was more of that uh, effect that you would see on some of those earlier, even Tesla uh, um, devices that you would see where they have like two spots and they're arcing between the two of those. That's typically that type of design. He didn't really have the, multi-wave oscillator antennas with that, but it was really more of that. Um, I consider those, they're both really out of phase with each other, but one is more acting like a transmitter receiver, whereas the other one are literally two transmitters, but in reality, they are transmitter receivers at the same time. So you ever set up, uh, you know, like a receiver coil. So I, I've taken uh, like a biocharger and actually had like a, a secondary coil like the like the one that would be on the left of it where it was just simply a coil next near the biocharger i could get sparks off of both of the coils even though the one when you looked inside the box there was no you know primary coil there was no switching whether it was a spark gap or vacuum tube or solid state there was none of that it was just simply a receiver that was tuned to that specific uh frequency of the carrier wave that uh, it could feed it. And, you know, there were, there were setups that I've had in the, uh, in the lab where I could fire that coil 
you know, eight feet away with the biocharger with that receiver set up and still pull a, a five or six inch spark off of the other one. So, um, so they're, they're sort of a little different, the same. I mean, you could sort of create that same effect if you wanted to have two biochargers running at the same time. We, we, you know, we have people that, uh, will do that type of setup and then sit in between both oh, of them. Okay. Uh, one thing that's pretty neat about that is, uh, when you run two two separate biochargers like that, and one's generating a unique set of hundreds of thousands of harmonics, and another one's doing another set that are different, then you get this hydrodyning effect where you're generating even more uh, harmonics because there's the mix between the two of them. Okay. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't even thought about that. Yeah, because this one right here is kind of a the replica that I was using, this was exact configuration. Yeah, so that, that's more of Lukowski design. Right, right Lukowski kind of had the patient with their feet on the ground. They were grounded. They sat between a transmitter and a receiver. And yeah, you were getting major sparks off the transmitter and minor sparks off the receiver. But I'm kind of curious about the Tesla because apparently Tesla didn't ground, uh, you know, the individual. They actually were, uh, you know, getting the, you know, they were sitting between the, the fields and they were not grounded. So they were getting that whole... I guess it's called induction, uh, like bird on the wire yeah. effect, as opposed to being grounded out where 50% of the of the energy is flowing to ground and, and the person becomes the conduit. But in the Tesla mode, it's more like you're you are it's you're enveloped by this and you're not it's not leaving you. It's just you're you're just basically submerged in the field yeah. and all of the energy is being you're being exposed to all of that energy. So I guess yeah, that was going my... the ground. What, what yeah. the biggest issue you have with the insulated off the ground is you have the uh, uh, that induced voltage. So, you know, you know, I always like to compare the uh, the bird on the wire. So you got yeah. the bird on the wire. Why isn't he getting electrocuted is because he's not on ground. Now, if you brought a wire up to that bird up there yeah put his feet up there you'd frighten an instant so oh, yeah you don't get that instant induced voltage and you know i also had an experiment that i had at home one day i was just playing around and i had you know biocharge earlier version next to a wood burning stove and i happened to see a little piece of lint that was on there so i brought my hand over by it and i could cause that piece of lint to stand up on its edge <laughs> about three or four inches away and i'm standing on a wooden floor that, uh, um, you know, that's on a foundation and uh, not on a foundation. Well, it has the, yeah, the foundation around the edges. So I had the gap between the, the wood floor and the actual earth ground, the ground itself. And then, um, I put my feet and I stood up on a milk crate and I did the exact same thing. And I could cause that uh, lint to stand up about you know, two or three feet away from it, just from that static electricity I was building out. And it made me realize that uh, you actually get more of an induced voltage doing it by being more insulated. Oh, yeah. That kind of reminds me, I was going to ask you about humidity. You made a comment in one of your interviews about humidity. And I was, I was just going to ask you about that. Because, you know, as I mentioned, I have a Bell's, uh, you know, the your one of your first iterations, I have a knockoff of that device. And I noticed that when the humidity changes in my house, you know, I have to be really careful about how close I put my hands to it because when it's really dry, that thing will throw out an arc really easy, you know? And so like, how does that work? How did, because I know you dampened that in the biocharger, right? The, you, you did yeah, well, something to humidity adapt for humidity. Like that. That's just the nature of the air itself. Okay. It's, it becomes a little bit less or more conductive is really what happens. And yeah. that, that even translates all the way down to the spark gap in that version of it. Oh yeah. You know, so uh, one of the things that's really neat with the solid state version is you're not getting that variability oh, with the humidity yeah. with the spark gap. You know, you're right. controlling it purely with the solid state. So you're not going to get quite as much variability off the top of it. Although one thing that we have noticed is when there seems to be more um, solar activity, you know, oh. from, you know, solar storms and things uh -huh. like that the corona actually gets a little bit bigger on there so wow, there are that's... so many different influences that you could have same thing with altitude too so uh -huh. um you know we noticed it at you know higher altitudes because it's thinner air it's gonna you know the air is gonna break down easier so you're gonna see a larger spark from it oh yeah that's interesting i'll have to do some yeah i'll do some testing with it then i'll see what it work how it works in uh during a a lightning storm. And see, <laughs> see what oh, yeah. I mean, I used to be able to see things. The other thing I used to see every once in a while, it was just so weird is if, especially after, you know, like you say, a lightning storm afterwards, there was 
there was something that was in the air that even when I'd shut off the biocharger, I, I would see my fluorescent light tube still flicker over time. I don't oh, know, yeah. never understood exactly what was causing that, but there are certain times that you will see things like that that will occur during the storms. And the other thing I also noticed that, you know, as you were mentioned, is the variance of sparks a little bit. I, I always could tell that some storm was coming in if I was seeing more activity with Corona discharge with it. Yeah, no, that's that's yeah, ex exactly. Whenever I use mine, I'm I'm watching the device and and seeing what it's doing, and it's different every time. Uh, no, that's really cool. Okay, so we talked about grounding versus not grounding, and uh, the issue of frequencies, Spark App versus you know the way you've designed it, which is brilliant. So let's talk about this other issue though about the difference, which is the dual antennas, and then you went to a single antenna. So in, in I'm just, just wanted to throw this out at you, but you know, I know that the Lacoste was basically in as well as Tesla, you sat between two uh, antennas and you were, it kind of produced this field, you know, transmitting to receiving and, and you sat in between, but with this single antenna design, especially since the original devices had this rodent coil, now you've now changed it to an aluminum toroid, right? which I'm yeah. assuming, so am I correct to assume that because you've changed it to a single antenna toroid, that you're not, the older way of doing it, the Klofsky Tesla way of doing it was sit between two antennas so that you're enveloped in the field. But now you've got this ability to just produce the field from one antenna, creating a toroidal effect so that it's Kind of just basically emitting this current and then kind of coming back onto itself. Is that is that about is this diagram kind of a representation of yeah, how does yeah, I think a it one is. I mean, it's almost a field that you generate. I mean, both yeah, of them will do field. that. You it's have these not, different yeah. fields that are interacting. You know, right. when you have two antennas like that, but with the one of it. But the other thing that you know we um, we didn't realize it at the very beginning, but definitely after COVID, you know, there's this social aspect of the biocharger. You know, so typically like with the multi-wave oscillator, you're sitting in between these antennas, you know, you're you're worried about whether or not you're going to get sparked with each other. And uh, whereas with this one, you have this uniform field. So with this uniform field, you can now sit multiple people like you're showing two different people, but you could easily sit, you know, three, four five people around it. Right, right. They're Thanks all you. still really <laughs> within that exact same type of field. And now it becomes more of a social event. And one of the things that... Uh, we're seeing, especially in uh, businesses, that people are really attracted to that part of it. You know, it actually becomes this event that people like to go to. And, you know, many, many locations, you know, they've met new friends as a result of that. You know, and they also get to have that shared experience that goes along with it. You know, we have places that use it for meditation or uh, breath, breath work or, you know, however you want to, or even just socializing you know, there's this aspect of having that connection communally and where you can share your shared experiences. And we find that that's also a very powerful part of that biocharger that you're, you have this shared experience with people and, you know, people like that, you know, you know, you know, medicine has gotten so isolated, you know, you consider hundreds of years ago, you know, when our uh, fellow friends would become sick, first thing we would do is, you know, bring them food, you know, we would help them with their crops, you know, we would pray for them and things like that. Nowadays, everything is just so isolated. We just feel so alone with it. And this sort of brings that community back together and people really are gravitating with it. And that's really part of the, the attraction with the biocharger, especially in a professional setting is people really like that. Yeah, you know, I think you really kind of hit on something that is really a unique aspect of the device is that it's meant for groups of people. Because, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm really into all these different, you know, things. And uh, and one of the things that I, I've been looking at recently is just the, you know, like these uh, ancient, uh, you know, like cathedrals and chambers and how they're not really churches. They're more like healing centers, you know, like the the windows and then the sculptures or everything are based on cymatic designs, you know, of frequencies on water. Uh, and then there's certain frequencies that these these buildings will create, and they're meant for groups of people to come in and do group healing. You know, that's what these ancients did with these frequencies and these structures. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. And then so, you know, if you, if you, you know, I just for the for the folks that aren't really familiar, I don't know, I'll just do a real quick one if you don't mind, Jim, but I just kind of wanted to show people like, you know, this was I don't know how many years ago was this? I mean, you started tinkering around 
uh, it's 80 years ago, right? 80 years ago, uh, the original idea of using, uh, you know, electricity for healing and wellness came from, you know, this Tesla and Lakovsky, but this is what it looked like. And, and, you know, when I was using my Lakovsky, the, you know, basically following his guidance is 30 inches, right? It's 30 or 33 inches between the antennas. And it's just, this is how it looked when people were using these devices in the medical field and, and also for uh, healing and wellness back in the day, 80 years ago, uh, this is what the device looked like. This is the original Olesa that Lakoski created. And this is all of the archival footage, you know, pictures of what people were doing. And so you could see that it was a singular experience and you had to be like 30 inches. You didn't get a lot of space. And that's why I always kept getting shocked all the time because oh, 30 yeah. inches is not very wide. And so you always end up bumping it with a knee or an elbow and you just get zapped. Um, and then, but the whole idea though, is people sat between these antennas. And I think that, I, I think it's just so cool what you've created so that you've, you've basically taken this uh, you know, this experience and you've created this group environment. And and I think that, and the field is huge. It's six feet in diameter, right? So, yeah. well, it follows the inverse square like anything else does. Oh, you know, yeah. Obviously, okay. the closer you get, we right. try to keep it uniform by, we all sit within the, you know, two to three feet around the biochargers, okay. the, the, the ideal of what we try to do with it. And okay. So like you're you still... say, you get, you know, a group of people, okay. you could easily sit, you know, five or six people around it. We typically don't sit behind it just because you have the power cord and things like that around it. And okay. you don't really want to stand on the power cord or something like that when you're that close to it. No, that right. That's a good point. The inverse square rule, uh, for those of you who haven't heard that before, Jim, what's the best way you'd describe that? So every time you double the distance, it's one fourth the power. There you go. So you want to sit. So even though the field is six feet, then it's more like the same thing with the Lakovsky, right? Which is you want to be close to it, you know, within 30 inches or 36 inches or three Yeah, you feet, get the right? voltage and magnetic sort of, field. You know, right. So that, that stuff drops off pretty quickly with it. And closer. You, know, you can get it a little further out. But, you know, when we started to look at it, people were like, yeah, I, I would look at it like uh, the rock concert. You know, when you got the free rock concert tickets, everyone yeah. wanted the front seat. And, you know, and then the next question would be is, you know, if I'm you know a little further out, am I getting the same benefit? Well, really, no, you're not. And so it's not exactly the same. Even though you're in a field, you probably will get benefit. It will be different than the the one that's sitting closest to it. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. I originally came, uh, lived in Honolulu for a long time and they got the Waikiki shell and I, I can't yep. tell you how many different concerts I attended sitting outside the shell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, we all be doing the, our, our well, my, my first, when I was first doing it in Montana, uh, when I first started selling the bell system, I used to just have an open door policy and people would come by. I, I think I ran it like two or three times a day and I'd have sometimes 20, 25 people standing around it, you know, all at once. And, uh, you know, that part is a neat experience. I mean, there is that power of the numbers, you know, just like in prayer or meditation, anything else like that, you get a group of people together. Yeah. People like that experience more than individually, but then uh, there's always that, you know, loss effect that you get further out that goes along with it. Yeah. So I took a look at your, uh, the 114 page user guide, which I think is fantastic that there is a guide and it's extremely detailed. Um, and then, so I just want to point out some things and if you could kind of touch on them and why they're so important, um, and, you know, just for people that are interested in experiencing the biocharger, but I kind of just pulled four real important things from the usage standpoint, which, you know, staying hydrated, you know, again, this, you know, sit within three feet from the biocharger for the best effect and keep your feet off the floor, which is that grounding issue. And then this whole thing about not touching others, you know, don't, cause you'll spark, right? Is that kind of what oh, yeah, you spark between it? Yeah, my earlier versions when I was building, you know, so my first multi-wave oscillator, I was getting uh, about a foot and a half spark off of each ring. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this is when we were all young and dumb. And the, I, the the game was as you'd sneak up behind the other guy, we used to be able to pull sparks sometimes four or five inches off of the guy's ears. So and it, what the worst part about it is the guy <laughs> would point the finger and get behind the ear. He didn't feel anything, but the other guy, he felt it a lot worse. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of the reason and also part of that same story back in the day you know i had a guy that was like uh well what would happen if i was grounded and i grabbed the spark and i was like well, you really don't want yeah. to do that you probably feel a lot more and 
he was super brave. He's like, I, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And boy, it, it hit him pretty hard. So that whole idea of being insulated off the ground is always a better idea than being barefoot on, you know, a concrete floor or something like that. So yeah. that's more of like that induced voltage that you get with it. You know, that's part of the reason why you want to have your feet up off the ground. And, you know, that three feet within that three feet distance is really that maximum uh, field that you want to be in. Yeah. And then of course there's precautions. So uh, I think it's real important. And I, I warn people in all of my videos about these devices is, you know, that hey, this is absolutely not for people who have electronic implants. Um, yep. And I, I saw that warning all throughout your guide. So bottom line though, unfortunately, everyone, if you've got an implant or you've got a device that's attached to you, uh, insulin pumps, those kinds of things. I mean, you, you just don't want to get into this, this high voltage field. Um, and uh, it's precaution. I guess more than just a precaution, it's a warning, don't do it, right? Well, for, for us, it's so um, part of the, you know, that CE markings, they, you know, they, they they were the ones that really came out with that part of it saying that, right. uh, you know, like uh, electronic parts and things like that. We still have people that have pacemakers that will use a biocharger, but they typically sit about, you know, six feet away from the biocharger. So you may not get as much of that magnetic field in the, uh, you know, the electric field, but you still are getting the benefits of the radio frequencies and the harmonics. And you also are getting the benefits of the, the light, obviously light will travel, you know, further distance than that, but they all follow that inverse square loss. But, uh, um, you know, depending on the, you know, the, you know, how far away you are and things like that. So, but definitely a, a, a hard no is any electron, what I call electromechanical devices, uh, implants, like you were saying. So if you're, you know, monitoring with the glucose monitoring uh, your insulin, and then you have it send a signal over to a thing that's automatically delivering your insulin. We just don't want to have anything affected or chemotherapy where it may inadvertently create a problem with it. We've never had an issue with it. Okay. And same thing with the pacemakers. It's really, um, you know, the, the pacemakers after the first generation, it wasn't really that much of an issue. They, they worked with the shielding and things like that. So we've never had an issue with anyone, especially with the, the pace. Well, we've never had any issues at all, but that's mainly because we set out all these precautions and things like oh, that. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the original, I guess the first decade of pacemakers, they were having lots of problems in airports, right? Going through those x-ray machines and things like that. Right. Uh, exactly. Okay. No, that's, that's good to hear that. That's or microwaves so or anything else. I mean, oh, there's yeah. so many different things that would affect it uh, right. on the first generation. So yeah. they figured that part of it out. And same thing with uh, some of them, they have these electric stim devices that are uh, implantable in the bodies. You know, we don't want to have that. And that's mainly because we don't want to scramble that up and damage the system or something like that. So right. uh, that's, that, those are the main things. But Overall, we've never had any issue when it came to anything like that, but you, you must take precautions. And, you know, that's part of our training and education. It, you know, we're just not dropping the biocharger off and saying, you know, good luck that, you know, we have like you clearly see with the manual, but we have a just an outstanding onboarding and advanced training that we do. And it's all done remotely that, uh, you know, by the time you're really done with it, you know exactly how to use the biocharger, you know how to ac access all the recipes, you know how to move them back and forth, you know how to search for recipes. So yeah. you really get to be pretty proficient very quickly. So we really made it easy for you. So it's not like you're programming in a bunch of numbers and things like that. And then you hit set, you know, you just select the recipe name, you hit start and off you go with it. And uh, it, we just really make it just uh, a really good user experience. Yeah. Yeah. I've got devices that literally would take a college course to figure out how to use the device proficiently. <laughs> so when I look yep. at your device, it's so user friendly. Uh, and that's such a, that's such a, you know, a, you know, just a nice change. So I guess yeah, the other question. thing is too, is huh? with that support, you know, we're always yeah. there for you. So even after you have your training, advanced training, you call us up and, you know, we're, we're there, we're there for it. And that's part of what drives our business is uh, having that outstanding support and uh, advanced training. So one of the things that we offer is a, uh, you know, 45 day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. You have to, you know, go through the training and advanced training and with it. But, uh, you know, we've been able to keep that return rate down below 1% because of our outstanding support team we have with it. So, 
you know, we, 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 we get the results that people are looking for. No, they're very impressive. It's, it's something that I, I tell people to, um, about how well, you know, a device works is just go on eBay and look for them being sold used. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I actually have like uh, alerts set up for every type of device. Cause that's my, you know, my realm. And, sure. I'm always looking at like, you know, and, and I actually purchased most of my stuff used uh, just because it saves a ton of money. And I found, you know, like all the devices I mentioned, I found them used. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've only seen a biocharger pop up once in three years. But I've I, but yeah. if you go right now, you know, there'll be just lists of different Rife devices um, that are for sale that are used because, you, you know, you just imagine they're, they're difficult to use. Uh, and, yep. to, and to understand. Well, also, there's so many variances with the right machines, yeah, too. You yeah. know, really, output is the most important thing. So if when you yeah. look at, you know, traditional right machines, the, the ones that are out and, out and about, you know, some of them are like 30 watt output, you know, you know maybe up to 120. Yeah. The most powerful is 300 watts. You know, we're variable up to 1,000 watts on the antenna. So when you really compare to ours as a right machine, it's a it's a very powerful Rife machine. And, you know, Rife was operating anywhere from seven to 800 watts uh, when his systems were out there. So we, you know, we're not just, uh, you know, we just took a bunch of these devices and threw it in a box and say, you know, it's like the Swiss Army now, right? but we, you know, we're best in class at a lot of them. Oh, very cool. Hey, one other question about uh, using the device. You know, so many people now are wearing Aura rings and Fitbits and, you know, like uh, smart watches. I mean, do you tell people to take that stuff off or is it safe to kind of just, you know, you, you know, be reading your phone while you're sitting next to it? Well, if we've never had any issues with the phone itself as far as like uh, hurting it or damaging it. But what it does is when you're trying to sit around the biochargers, it affects the touch screen. So that touch screen works off a of capacitive touching. Yeah. So what'll happen is if you're trying to type on your biocharger or I mean on your phone, what you will see sometimes is just starting to type out a bunch of letters, even though you're not really touching anything. And if you try hitting the backspace, you know, it, even worse, it, you know, or if you try, or you know, the screen just like bounces around. You know, we had one time, uh, uh, somebody had the biocharger. It's only when it's, you don't have to turn the phone totally off, but it's like when you have it on and you're in that mode of that touch screen and you're trying to use it. Um, Somebody set the phone down like that, and after 15 minutes, they get a frantic call from their uh, family member saying, oh, you just called me 100 times. Are you all right? Type of thing. So <laughs> it didn't hurt the phone, but it, it did that. Now, with the smart watch or the, the watch itself, because that's always in that touch screen mode, you may want to set that off to the side. Yeah. But the aura rings... Uh, you know, the, those, the, the whoop band people haven't really had too much of an issue. And one thing that's really neat about anyone that's wearing any of those, uh, you know, those devices that are measuring different things, whether, whether it's HRV or sleep yeah. and things like that, you know, we clearly move the needle every time with those, with, with those types of systems, people, especially over time, see those numbers go up. Their sleep quality is much better. Uh, their HRV is much better. They recover faster. Their heart rate is much better. Heart rate variability is much better. Yeah, I thought I thought that would be really cool to kind of you know literally watch before, during, and after. You know the 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 data coming off the ring or the. Yeah, the, the it is a little tricky just because you know you're, but then, you're, you're creating that field in there. Right, that, uh, <laughs> but then it can it's be sitting, a little bit yeah. trickier with it. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine because, you know, at the, yeah, at the same time, you know, it's sitting in this field. So, you know, is it really able to even function? Yeah, but, you get, okay. get, get an exact answer on, you know, compared to when it's off. I'm not really quite sure on that one. Yeah. Okay. No, that's just, that's it. That's good to know. Uh, okay. So let's talk about, you know, like, so, you know, like you mentioned kind of the Swiss Army knife, but it's not, it's just this really best in class uh, co compilation of different, you know, functionalities, modalities and, and tech, you know, and technical specs. So, but cause I wanted to kind of uh, talk about individually just to kind of just get your feedback on this, because the more I researched into the biocharger, the more I'm starting to wonder, like, wow, you know, where were you guys? <laughs> where was this, you know, like 15 years ago when I, I, you know, I bought this giant PMF device for my horse. Um, and those things are really expensive. You know, the big ones on, in, on the, on the, that run on, you know, that real, you roll around on wheels. Like I mentioned, I've had, I have like, I have four or five PMF devices, four different Rife devices. I got all this stuff. And I'm not, I'm not even, I'm like this, I'm the wellness center for myself, basically, and my family and my pets. 
And then you've got all these, you know, obviously they got the wellness centers themselves. They have the same issue. They've got all this equipment. And so like, you know, like the biocharger can do so much. I'm just wondering, like, you know, like, you know, do you, you know, if you wanted to do all these different things, you know, you either buy them separately or you biocharger might replace it. Right. So can we talk yeah. about each individual one and kind of just say, Hey, if I like, let's, I'm coming from the perspective of like this device right here, this is uh, similar to what I own right now. I've got this one as well. I've got, had this one. I'm just like wondering, like, you know, instead sure. of having this and, and having three or four or five or seven different things, having just one thing that does it all is it would be just a miracle at this point and save a lot of money. Uh, so let's talk about pulse electromagnetic field and the devices that come along and they come from every little tiny itty bitty thing like the mirror made all the way up to the giant magnet waves. Um, so, you know, like, so the biocharger as a PEMF device, right? First question to the, everybody who says, Hey, you take out the P and you got EMF and quote, isn't EMF bad. Could you address that? Cause you've, you addressed it so well when you were talking to, uh, I think it was Dave Asprey, uh, you know, in terms of just like in the difference between PEMF and e yeah. you know, EMF, cause everyone hears EMF bad, right? That's all you hear nowadays, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about the, you know, the EMF uh, issue and I can, I can debate both sides of the equation, you know? So when you look at the scientific evidence that's out there, especially like, uh, you know, power lines, cell phones, things like that. You know, when you look at the, you know, traditional scientific evidence, you know, there isn't a lot of that, you know, you're, you're not producing fields enough that uh, are creating heating, you know, power lines are probably the biggest source of noise. But again, everything follows the inverse square law. So, you know, the, the, the power lines are pretty far away from you. So you're really not getting a lot of that field from it to where I, in my opinion, you're, you know, in, in the scientific consensus is saying there's probably, you know, not much to that. Um, but there is a difference between, you know, pulsing it and then a continuous wave. So when you look at traditional EMF noise, you know, you got the power line. So the power lines can't be pulsed off and on. Otherwise, your motors would be surging up and down and they would be burning up. and They wouldn't be working properly. So, you know, that, that's more of a, what I consider a continuous wave. Um, you also have like cell phones, you know, cell phones, they can't be pulsed off and on because you'd lose connection and that security part that goes along with it, you know, so for, for like computers and things like that. So I look at those as more as a continuous wave um, type of an effect where there might be more of that entrainment that you would typically see with it. So I think that that's, distinctly different than say what nature is actually doing, which is pulsing. So, you know, when you look at um, all the EMF that man-made produces, if you add up all the power line energy, you add up everything from cell phones, Wi-Fi, communications, you know, uh, military Airports. communications, <laughs> uh, emergency communications, microwaves, all that, add that up, it's still magnitudes less than what nature produces. As I mentioned, nature is producing these lightning discharges that are occurring in the planet, 100 every second that's maintaining, you know, each one's producing hundreds of thousands of different little radio frequencies and harmonics, you know, that span that entire spectrum, as well as all the other planets and everything else. You add up all that energy, it's still magnitudes greater. And we evolved in that sea of energy. So, there is a part that it is a necessary part of our lives. It isn't just, you know, when we go outside, we just don't feel good because we're outside. It's because we are exposed to that natural energy. And when you think about it hundreds of years ago, you know, we spent most of our time outdoors, you know, um, tending to the crops, you know, chopping wood to survive the next year. Whereas now we're spending, you know, 90% of our time, 93% of our time indoors in the United States. And most of the time we're, you know, surrounded by that man, you know, the man-made stuff. And, you know, if you're in a building that's got rebar in the walls or metal roof or something like that, that's yeah. literally blocking all that energy. And there was a great study that was done at Max Planck Institute. Uh, they were looking at a, I think it was about a 25-year period. And I think they had over 300 participants in this. And they had two buildings, one that was fully shielded and the other one that wasn't identical buildings, but there was shielding that was built into it. And they would move them back and forth and monitor them. 
And they found that physiological changes were occurring, you know, within a very short order, days that you were seeing changes in the body from it. So there is an aspect of it that when you shield that, that has an effect. Not only that, when you look at, you know, this energy level that's varying, you know, what we call solar flares and all that stuff. So they've been monitoring all this activity since the 1850s. And then, you know, since then, you know, it's always been varying, you know, sometimes it, uh, there's less energy in the atmosphere, you know, coming from nature. Sometimes there's more really depending on that, what I consider the cosmic dance. So you got all these planets and, you know, stars and everything moving around and, you know, you're getting closer to some things that are larger, you're getting further away from other things, you know, the, you know, everything is just shifting around. So nothing is really constant. And what they found is when there was more activity, more solar activity, you had better crops, you had less deaths, you had less stillbirths, you had uh, better wines, less turmoil. And, uh, you know, so there there is a lot of variability in it. I always like to tell the story. There's a what they call the Carrington event. I just found out about this about a, six months ago. So there was a, when they first started looking at uh, uh, solar storms, there's this uh, guy named Carrington that was, you know, monitoring from the earth, looking at through his uh, telescope and looking at the sun and was seeing all this activity that was going on in the sun. I mean, it was just going off big time, solar flares galore. And then, uh, all of a sudden, there was this massive discharge from the sun that created, I think, either hydrogen or helium bubble that blasted right to Earth. And at that point, it lit up the entire planet for two days straight like it was daylight. Wow. That was that much okay. energy that was a result of that. And um, if you look up this Carrington event, it's it's quite the story. They, you know, the, it was reported in the Boston newspaper that the uh, uh, the telegraphs were overcharging because all those wires were direct, you know, laid out throughout the throughout the planet, and they were picking up all this energy and they were overcharging the batteries. And there was a telegraph that was an operator that was in Boston, or actually in Maine first. It said disconnected his battery and he was still communicating to the guy in Boston. So he told the guy in Boston to disconnect his batteries too. And they were still communicating without the batteries that were involved. And they, they reported it actually worked better than when the batteries were there. They said that the, the miners in Colorado woke up in the middle of the night because they thought it was in the middle of the day. It was, it was recorded and that people were reading a newspaper outside at night as if it was daylight. They saw the roar borealis as low as uh, uh, Hawaii, you know, near the equator, Hawaii and uh, uh, Panama City. And it was on both sides of the globe. It was reported all around the world. So we have these events that uh, we get this variability with that I think is a, a really important part of our life that we actually evolved in. So um, I don't necessarily fit in the camp that EMFs are necessarily bad because we evolved in the sea of energy and when you really think about it our bodies are driven by this sea of energy you know so you know when ben franklin threw the kite up in the air you know he wasn't just generating lightning bolts during the uh thunderstorms but even on clear days when you got the kite higher and higher you could measure a difference of voltage of potential that we later found out that it's almost a million volts between the upper atmosphere and earth so this energy is being maintained by what I consider the electric universe, which is really nothing but lightning discharges. And then when you have these variable frequencies and harmonics that are going on from this natural event, they're literally ringing uh, every cell, every molecule, every atom as a result of all this energy that's around. So I really feel this EMF, this natural EMF is such a vital part of our life. And when you block that all out and you get rid of it, it's just not a good thing. Now there is some arguments or you know you know contentions of well there that um, uh, EMS may cause some uh, oxidative stresses, which you know evidence is you know showing that, that you know some instances that it is causing oxidative stresses. But 
you know, there's a lot of things that can, can cause oxidative stresses. You know, I can run and that creates oxidative stresses. I can eat the right foods and it can cause oxidative stress. I can eat the wrong foods and cause oxidative stress. I could have an aggravating conversation on the phone and it cause oxidative stresses. So <laughs> it may not necessarily yeah. be what we're actually seeing with it. Although there are people that say that, you know, they do have issues with it. But, you know, I go back to that continuous wave versus pulse yeah, wave, I think that's which is key. really the key in it. And when you really look at all the research, when you add the P into it, there is so many research articles that supports the benefits of PEMF. No, that makes complete sense. Thanks for sharing that. Because I think that's the key issue here is that pulsed electromagnetic field versus continuous, which is this man-made constant that never turns off, never, you know, changes, right? There's a huge difference in how our bodies are, uh, you know, adapt to it or not, don't adapt to it. But I, I guess yep. the other thing too is, is as you're mentioning proximity, I kind of, I phrase that to people uh, as the term severity of exposure, because clearly, you know, I, I would recommend EMF shielding if you live within 1300 feet of a cell phone tower, because that's what the, the you know, that's what the the science shows, right? That you're going to, you're, you're too close to proximity, severity, as opposed to, you know, just the general EMF. And then again, too, I mean, you got all these people selling these, uh, you know, Faraday tents for their beds and, and I, and my, <laughs> I'm always warning people, you know, don't sleep in a Faraday cage, you know, it's like, no. you don't cut yourself off. So yeah, again, I just real simply that, you know, EMF is good and bad. Bad is severity of exposure, proximity, good is hey we grew up in it and then pulsed even makes it uh even better it actually becomes beneficial right so now sure. in terms of the biocharger and pemf if if a if a person wanted to use the biocharger as just a pemf device does it just is that a recipe that you would run or the the device as by default is generating pulse electromagnetic field yeah, by default, it's generating okay. that. It's mainly that I, I look at PEMF as really PMF. It's that magnetic field. So many of these devices, you know, like the ones that are on the left there, those are more like the Himholtz co coil type. So they typically have some winding that's in there. And it's almost like an electric magnet type that's producing a magnetic field. And then that one on the right, that, you know, the, the big unit, those are really more of the LC circuit, the inductor capacitor circuit, which is really the heart of the primary coil of a Tesla coil. So any Tesla coil will have that uh, LC circuit. So that LC circuit, so what'll happen is you, in that circuit, you have an inductor and you have a capacitor. And what happens is they ping pong back and forth with this electric field, mag, you know, magnetic field. So the capacitor builds up a charge, it discharges into inductor and it produces for a very short period of time, a very strong magnetic field, which is a lot different than those ones that are on the left, which are really more of an electric magnet. But the many of the, the devices that are really coming on strong are those uh, more of the higher energy. And, you know, there's, you know, a lot of questions, you know, they always try to differentiate themselves with, uh, you know, the gauss and things like that, the magnetic field of those higher energy. Some, some of them make the you know, the wild claims, it might be 10 Tesla, 15 Tesla, something like that. But uh, um, I, from what I've seen, as far as the research with it and understanding with it, you can't typically use a, a Gauss meter to use to measure those types of systems that are LC, mainly because it's such a, a quick pulse. And that pulse, it also scrambles what you're reading. So what you may be reading might not be what you're producing, which is of concern. Typically, what you need to use is a whole sensor. When you use a whole sensor, you can actually you know determine what that magnetic field, uh, instantaneous magnetic field strength, as I as I like to call it. So that that one on the right or those high energy ones, yeah. those are typically what you would see in a in the base of a Tesla coil. So if I took out the secondary in the bulb and I just ran the base of it, that would be more of that PEMF or PMF type of it field mm -hmm. that you would generate okay. with it. Um, but we typically don't operate it in that manner. So when I started to really understand and broke down really what we were doing, I broke it down into those four categories of that PEMF or that, that and, and then you have the electric field, which is really a little bit different than the magnetic field 
but they do different functions. And, you know, the, the beauty of a Tesla coil, whether it's the multi-wave oscillator or those off versions of, you know, the spin-offs of the earlier versions that I, I was working with, they have a, a magnetic field component that's uh, comparable to it, but you have to be relatively close to that field. So typically to really get the maximum benefit of the magnetic field of the biocharger, you would want to be close to the base of the biocharger versus up more towards the top. So sometimes people will put their legs or their knees or something like that close to the magnetic field. So you're 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 always getting that when you're running the biocharger. That's just part of it. You can't isolate it just because that's what really what drives the biocharger. Okay. So so and so uh, yeah, because I you know like bottom line the way I was looking at it is so you're running the biocharger and it's not going to be um, something that you're going to feel because like like with one of these I I can feel it. I mean it's so strong. Uh, but then you know, like a paddle device like I think this is two three thousand gauss. Uh, you know, even all I know it's running only because I can hear the click, but I, I don't feel it. So, uh, in terms of like, can a user that wants to get a PMF effect from the biocharger, can they adjust the pulse rate or adjust the Gauss, or is just it's going to be a constant thing? And to use it, you know, and to experience more of the PMF is just be closer to the base. Is that what you would recommend? Yeah, you would be closer to the base, but okay. there is a differentiation between like, especially the the one that's on the right there. So that that type of circuit, they don't really get much of a, a variability of them. Many of them uh, yeah. still use the spark gap design. So right. you'll see some of them, they'll pulse at that low frequency. Part of the reason why you get that, like you say, you feel that it almost like it, it, it causes you to tense up or what I like to say, flop like a fish. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost yeah. a little bit uncomfortable. Now our field magnetic field strength is, pretty comparable to that but the box is so it, the, the magnetic field is inside the box so um the further out you get from it the less you're going to get that whereas you know with that system you're laying you're right up against that primary coil that's on there and that's why they have that big insulation that's around that is because uh uh that plastic that's around that so you you, you won't get hurt from that but uh but uh we didn't like that experience with it that, you know, you, 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 it, 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 as you mentioned, you feel that it's almost uncomfortable, especially as you turn it up. And there is also almost like this twitching effect. So when you're pulsing mm -hmm. at those low frequencies, you just see yourself. And you know, I almost look at it as like flopping like a fish. And we didn't want to have that experience, but we still wanted to have that magnetic field experience. You know, benefit with it. So we're slightly out of that range where you get that. And the other thing is too, is, you know, because it's part of the circuit and it's also being influenced by the recipe itself, we're able to pulse it at different frequencies. So, you know, that system, like the one that's on the right, you know, I, I think pulse systems go up to hundred Hertz on theirs. A lot of them are just doing that excuse me, three to four hertz or maybe up to 20 hertz that they pulse it up on there. You know, we're able to pulse the magnetic field up to 50,000 hertz. And we're also able to, you know, vary within that pulse with that duty cycle. So there, you know, our magnetic field is far more complex and far more variable than what you would typically see with that type of system. But we're still generating this, the field in a very similar way as far as that. Okay. That circuit that lc circuit that goes along with it all right so, so more, i mean we okay. we may not be best in class at making you flop like a fish but i consider us best in class in the variability that you get with it as far as also the programmability that you go along with it you know part of that magnetic M mri magnetic resonance is you know you have that variability in that magnetic resonance and you really want to have that variability to create the different fields that you have so our magnetic field is definitely a variable, but that's also driven by the recipe itself. So, okay. no, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's a subtle PMF device, and definitely not meant for horses. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, they, we have people that are using it for horses, and stuff, I would love to see what that does that in a barn. You, yeah, you, know, you 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 want them to to really feel that one, and, and you know, people still have the similar experiences with it. I mean, they may not have that. Uh, um, you know, intense what you really feel at that moment in time while you're using it. But 
people aren't really looking for how you feel while you're using the biocharger. They're looking, or any of these devices, they're looking at how you feel after you use it. So yeah. after you use the Good biocharger, point. you know, people are just reporting all sorts of different uh, experiences and outcomes that uh, are very favorable for what they were looking for. Yeah, no, good point. Now, when it comes to Rife, now we've discussed Rife quite a bit already, and I just kind of wanted to point out that, you know, uh, what you were saying earlier is that, you know, the true way of using Rife, the way he did it was through radio frequency transmission. Basically, uh, he ran like a little mini AM radio station, and then he shot frequencies through it. You know, that's kind of how my interpretation is. And and instead, you're you're basically broadcasting frequencies through this field, right? That while you're in the field, you're experiencing instead of it being like radio waves or more like it's it's within the electrical magnetic field that you're standing in, right? Is that correct? In uh, terms of like correct. how it so, compares to Rife. Actually, Rife was actually in the shortwave range. So that 3.2 oh, okay. megahertz is more in that uh, shortwave range. Oh, okay. So, but he was pulsing it off and on like a, a biocharger does. So we're, we're doing it in similar manners. So our carrier wave, as you, you reported a little earlier, was 217 kilohertz. So we were in AM we're more in the AM radio okay. where they're more in the uh, shortwave range. Oh, okay. But the key was, is that modulation generates the sideband harmonics. That's what, that's really the, the crux of Rife machines are those sideband harmonics. And as you pulse at different frequencies, you generate those unique sets of uh, sideband harmonics. And that's how he would tailor make them. So it may not be the, you know, the first harmonic that's doing the work, it could be the second or third, you know, because of when you look at the the molecular band spectrum as well as the magnetic resonance spectrum, you know, that's a whole range of frequencies that they were operating at. So it it has the similar effect, but the the big differential is you don't get that magnetic field in the electric field. I mean, you do get some magnetic field PEMF off of the, any electric equipment, but you're really not getting that true PEMF like that first one you were pointing at in the PEMF system. You're not getting really that instantaneous uh, magnetic field that you would typically get with a, a multi-wave oscillator or a PEMF system. You're not really getting that benefit. And then there's always that differences of the different types. So you're showing the Pearl M or the Pearl, I think that they were 120 watts on the antenna and i think that they may have bumped it up a little bit more because the you know the the mac daddy was the mopa uh the one on the right i think yeah. that they were at 300 watts uh on the antenna but when you compare it to what rife was operating he was up to seven or eight hundred watts on the antenna and when you look at ours we're up to a thousand watts on the antenna so when you look at as a rife machine itself and as you're doing the pulse frequencies we could do the hoyland sweeps we could do the various pulse frequencies up to 50,000 Hertz that Hoyland was working with, as well as the great frequency ranges of all the right frequencies that are out there. You know, we were operating all within what, uh, you know, his award, original works were working at. Um, and it is, you, as you noted, you have some of those handheld devices, you know, the, the handheld, I, I don't really consider those right machines. I consider those more as tens units. I think that the, you know, when you really look at the history of that type of system, you know, it was really John Crane that came out with that. So John Crane came into Rife's life at the end, and he came up with this idea of just sort of using a like a function generator that you could do these different pulse frequencies. Yeah. And then you had a little voltage step up that could, you know, give you that little pulse jolt that you could do. And then you, you could vary it, you know, some of those Bob Beck. Uh, zappers and things like that they were all within that you know that that same category so i don't really consider it and there are benefits with it i mean there's clearly benefits with the uh you know with the uh the 10 type type of systems you know there you know for decades now i think the chiropractors have been using those types of systems and many people have built those own little systems that they had based off of bob beck's designs or the health of Clark zappers and things like that. So you had a lot yeah. of those different types that were out there. Yeah, I was going to ask I you classify about... that more as that, although the, I think that one on the far left is that violet Ray. 
I, uh, I classify the violet ray as more as those are like miniature Tesla coils that had that little plasma tube that's on there. So if right. you ever use one of those, those are more of the high voltage uh, devices. And those were very popular in the you know, early 20s and 30s. And they had, some, you know, some of them had the little tumblers that were in there, but it still operated like a induction Tesla coil type system that they would um, you know, have the different gas tubes that they could put on there. And, uh, you know, many of the estheticians and many spas and things like that have really, you know, for decades have been using those types of systems. And, you know, there was the, uh, oh, I can't remember what his name that really popularized it. Uh, Edgar Casey. He, he oh, spoke yeah. very yeah. highly of those. Exactly. Those are, those are yeah. quite a bit different than the, you know, like the other ones that you're showing here, the TENS unit, the uh, uh, the Zetas, as well as the... Uh, um, I've got the, yeah, I got CNARS. Jerry Tennant system. CNARS, microcurrents, TENS yeah, units, Beck zappers, Clark zappers. That's kind of where I was thinking too, because I have all this stuff, right? And so do all these clinics. And, uh, you know, there's actual, you know, full on, you know, in Russia, there's CNR clinics. That's all they do is CNR. There's a whole group of people that all they do is microcurrent. And of course, there's the, all the people doing Beck and Clark, Clark zapping. And as I look at the biochanger, I'm like, wow, you know, wait a minute. The specs are, when you look at these devices, all of this stuff that costs lots of money and all these different things, and they all have the same like frequencies and, uh, you know, electrical discharge right uh that the biocharger does so i'm just kind of like i'm just my question is is wouldn't getting a biocharger sort of be a comparable uh substitution or you know alternative than let's say getting a cnr getting a violet ray getting a tens you know all of this other stuff i mean what's your thought you know when i when i and by the way everybody i know you you purists out there are gonna are gonna kill me on on the numbers i'm throwing on up on the screen but i just want to say I used AI to summarize the general frequencies uh, and amperages and gauss of all these devices. And that's where these numbers come from. But when I look at these numbers and I'm looking at, you know, like microcurrent, one to 1500 hertz, right? Three to 10 milliamps or, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically the Beck zapper, 3.92 hertz running at 50 to 100 milliamps. And when I think, look at this information and I'm thinking, well, all of this stuff does electrotherapy in one form or another. Well, so does the biocharger. But the biocharger yeah. kind of covers all of this stuff if you were to you know, look at it broad sweep, right? And then at the same time, uh, you have recipes. So could you kind of comment that? My question is, is, wouldn't the biocharger be able to do all the same stuff that all these other devices do? Because they yeah, are... and I mean, one thing it's neat about the biochargers, yeah. you know, in nature we're not wired up to you know the cosmic rays. We're not wired up to the lightning discharges. You know, that it's it, it 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 radiates at you. You're still getting the electric field, but now your whole body becomes more of the electrodes. And plus, a lot of these yeah. systems that you're talking about are pulsing at one frequency at a time. You know, whereas what we're doing is we're doing hundreds of thousands of frequencies at a time. That's just part of the nature of the sideband harmonics that you get with it, which is really more in the in the lines of nature and how it's generated. And, you know, like, you know, in my very biased opinion, you know, yeah, I think the biocharger definitely encompasses all these different benefits that you would typically get with a, a biocharger. Yeah. So instead, yeah, so having... Yeah, that's my whole point. I, you know, when I, I look at it just from a spe you know specification standpoint, what the biocharger can do with and without what recipes, and then each one of these things that I own and what they specifically do, plus the you know the claims and the benefits that each one of these different devices, like just taking out like let's just say for example blood electrification, you know Bob Beck's uh, expansion of that original discovery by the two guys at the Einstein Institute. Uh, and, and so the idea of blood electrification is simply just, you know, exposing your blood uh, to, you know, 3.92 hertz uh, at, at, at 550 to 100 milliamps, right? But I'm thinking I could do blood electrification with the biocharger because it does the same thing. I just would run. Do you actually, do you have a recipe for blood electrification or I just turn on the blood? I just well, I turn think it it's on. Sort right? of, I mean, it yeah, it just kind of, it's the same like that. effect. I mean, right? I, I don't want to yeah. you know, link claims or anything else like that. Okay. But yeah. I, I think that uh, one can uh, deduce that, uh, you know, there are many ways you can create an electric field. You know, you could make a contact with it. And part of the problem with the contact is, is it's really 
more of a localized effect versus, you know, a full body that you would typically get with it. But yeah, you know, and the other thing you didn't really allude to either is you could have these 10 devices and, you know, you, you do all 10 of them. That's going to be what, 15 hours in a day. You yeah. Know, many people exactly. don't have that. And one there's, thing that's there's, nice yeah. is, you know, you sit down with a biocharger, you run it for, you're right. you know, yeah, yeah. 15 minutes and you're done. Do that a couple yeah. times a day if you have it at home. If you, you know, go to a location where you have locations all over the world, uh, you can go and use it at, you know, you go use it two or three times a week for, you know, half an hour and you're good to go. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, yeah, you're right. But, you know, Beck Zapper takes two hours. Uh, yeah, you can take the right three, machines. 40 minutes. You cycle in all those right yeah. machines and stuff. You're there another couple hours and then you got yeah. your, your, your zappers you're going to do. And then you got your PEMF, you know, they want a half hour to hour on that. And yeah, you know, depending uh, on the system, some of them are hours, some of them they want you to sleep on You, you know, now you're just, you're, you're a gadget guy that you're, you're tied to it. You know, you're really not able to go live your life. Whereas this, you, 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 you set a recipe really quick and you're there for 15 minutes and then you're off to the day. And, that's how many people do it. If they have it in their homes, you know, a lot of them like it as a ritual. They wake up, they use it in the morning. They have a certain recipe they do. You know, the afternoon when everyone gets that little tired feeling or whatever, they'll go over and sit the biocharger again and, you know, maybe run another one at night, you know, if they have it at home or people just go and use it. But, uh, you know, we're, we're finding even if you go, you know, one time a week and do it a couple, you know, two or three recipes one time a week, they're, they're still getting benefits, so. No, yeah, no, I get it. That, that's a good thought. I didn't think thought about it that way. I was thinking about it like just, you know, just from a white sweep that it actually spec versus spec that it all yeah. falls together. All of that different stuff falls within the biocharger spec. So let's talk about the biocharger spec as it relates to all of the, you know, the biophoton uh, modulation therapies out there right now. I mean, cold lasers really, really popular, uh, you know, obviously red light therapies all over the place now. And of course, there's uh, UV lamps, you know, the vitamin D lamp kind of thing. So what? how would you say that the biocharger from a biophotonic device compares to these other devices at other clinics and, and people? Like, I actually own two of these three things. So how how does that compare in, you know, from your perspective? Yeah, so when you're looking at that that one over on the left there first, uh, so you're, you're pulsing light off and on up to 10,000 hertz. You know, so pulsing light definitely... Uh, uh, behave pulse light at different frequencies behave differently than continuous light or comparing amongst each other. Um, I don't know if it's more related as you pulse it. I think that there's a different effect on how it penetrates the body possibly, but as a, as a light part of it, you know, we're able to pulse up to 50,000 Hertz. So I think that, you know, it, again, when you compare it to like the one on the left, you know, I, I consider us best in class, you know, when you look at some of those, you know, they they have some variability on the light there. I don't know if they're doing all that from 600 to a thousand nanometers on the wavelength on that. But, uh, you know, typically when you talk about cold lasers and stuff, they're, they, they usually operate at a specific light wavelength that they're operating at. Same thing with like that, uh, the red light therapy. Sometimes they'll do, uh, infrared and far infrared light that they're in there, but they're typically just a, a couple different wavelengths that they work with. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get more of that uh, full spectrum. So, you know, again, going back into nature, you know, so when you look at nature, you got, uh, um, you got that natural light, not just the sunlight, but you got the natural light. So what is really natural light is I consider that blue in the sky. So that blue in the sky, you know, one of the most common questions children ask their parents and they get wrong is what causes that blue in the light? And, you know, some of them will say, well, it's a reflection of water because the earth is mostly water. Uh, but in fact, it's really because all these gases that are in the atmosphere. So everything that's on a periodic table exists up in the atmosphere in different um, amounts. You know, when you look at our atmosphere, it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. But what happens is when it gets exposed to, uh, you know, the magnetic field from the sun, the solar, you know, just everything, they get excited to fluorescent and they release photons of light, literally thousands of different wavelengths in the infrared, far infrared, near infrared, visible light spectrum. So okay. what we're doing is we're trying to mimic the way nature does it. So we're not working at any particular specific, you know, a few wavelengths, but we're looking at 
maybe about a thousand different wavelengths in the infrared, far infrared, near infrared, visible light spectrum. Now, our infrared, far infrared is for a very short period of time. So when you look at the, you know, so when uh, um, when you have these gases in the atmosphere and they get excited to flu fluorescent, what will happen is they, uh, you know, for like the gases that we use, the neon, for instance, you know, they, they're existing in the pair. And when you excite them, they separate for a short period of time. And then when they recombine, they release these photons of light. But during that cycle of separation, they scale through infrared, far infrared, near infrared into visible light when they release the photons. So we're in for a very short period of time that we're releasing it. But what we're doing is uh, a much wider spectrum of frequencies. So, um, you know, you will see more wavelengths in that spectrum, but they're not quite as intense. So you're not like with the red light, you know, you're sitting in front of a, you know, this infrared light, you know, a lot of times they want you to, you know, naked, you got this big panel yeah. that you're sitting in there, or you're sitting there in your underwear right. or whatever, trying to absorb as much of that infrared, far infrared. And that's a very important benefit. You know, as I mentioned before, you got this magnetic resonance as well as the molecular band. So all molecules are vibrating in the infrared, uh, far infrared, near infrared, up to visible light. So that's part of the reason why they work is because they're literally uh, vibrating those molecules in that, in that spectrum. So the fuller the spectrum, the more effect that you're going to get on different molecules as far as what I would see with it. Okay. And then no, with the may, UV yeah. side of it, you know, you do get a, yeah. a little bit of UV. I mean, we, at one point we were using a, a, a mercury tube that did have a, a little bit of the UVC that was being emitted from it, you know, we did discontinue that bulb mainly um, just because there was always that negative connotation with it. You know, people just didn't like mercury because they thought mercury was bad. But in reality, you're not dealing with the mercury because it's sealed in the tube. It's releasing light. So, you know, we we replaced it with the iodine tube. So we with ours, we use uh, the noble gases or inert gases, the uh, hydrogen or not hydrogen, um, helium, neon, argon. Krypton, xenon, and then we have an iodine tube also. So okay. we're trying to produce more of that fuller spectrum that we do. We use two sets of six tubes. So we wanted to do it that way. So anywhere you would sit around the biocharger, you're exposed to those same six tubes, just like everyone else all the way around it. So we wanted to make it more uniform with the six tubes. Okay. So more full spectrum, not specific. Like each one of these devices is a very narrow spectrum specific you know specificity right towards what it's trying to do and you're more uh broad spectrum which is nature again uh, and then but yeah. not but you're not putting out uv right so there's no danger of yeah there's not a uv, UV exposure. so you don't need to wear okay. goggles or anything else like that okay all right good hey i know you got a hard stop coming up real quick so i just want to jump to the end and i just want to just say you know hey thank you so much for your time and so now, you know, if anyone's interested in experiencing the biocharger, I know from, uh, you know, all the information I've gotten from your site that, you know, that there's wellness centers, uh, as you mentioned, there's thousands of wellness centers that have these in them. Um, and so how does, how does a person you know, like, let's say they just want to try it, maybe, you know, not so much, you know, buy one, but how would you, what would you, what do you tell people that just want to give this a try and, and, and see how it works for them? Well, what, what we suggest is you go to biocharger.com. You can learn all about the biocharger. You can, you know, get a lot of the information I just shared with you if you wanted to, you know, read it for yourself. And actually a lot more. We have great testimonials, but we also have a great spot that says find the nearest biocharger location. And it'll pop up a map and it'll show you all the different locations that are offered. And, you know, there, there are variable costs on it. You know, we're in many different types of locations. You know, some of them offer it as a, a monthly subscription rate, you know, some of the higher end places that are uh, uh, more like functional doctors and things like that, where it's more of a specific thing, they they may charge, uh, you know, more with it. But uh, typically sessions are, you know, onesie twosie, I think maybe $30 a session, it's usually a, a buck a minute, something like that is what uh, uh, people may charge, but if you get those packages, you know, some of them have some great packages where you get monthly subscription rates where you can, you know, go use it for three or four times a week and, uh, um, you know, just have a flat subscription model with it. So 
that works out really well for uh, people that want to go ahead and try the biocharger. That's a great source. You could also reach out to us and, uh, you know, you know uh, we could also help you with finding that nearest location. And if you wanted to do any purchasing, we do have uh, financing available for people who want to buy the biocharger. It isn't really leasing, but it's more of the uh, 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 financing. It's more of a, you know, you, you finance to own. Uh, great interest rates, you know, all that's driven by, uh, you know, your uh, credit qualifications and things like that. So, um, you know, we do make it affordable for people for, you know, purchase, purchasing a biocharger. And, you know, many of these locations, that, you know, they can go and buy the biocharger and uh, they're up and going and they're, they're paying for that biocharger, uh, paying, paying and making money right away with it. Uh, you know, the monthly payments are are clearly offset by what they're bringing in with it. So it's okay. been a great program for the people that want to, uh, you know, create their own, you know, quote, biohacking center, or, you know, if you're a practitioner or a, a therapist that want to add this to their uh, collection in their toolbox, you know, people love to have that. And what they'll find out, it really becomes the the fan favorite. And when you go look at uh uh, many of the testimonials or the podcasts, like you suggest, uh, you've listened to a number of different podcasts. I mean, I've, I've done quite a few podcasts with all types of people, whether it's from, you know, Osteo Strong to, you know, the, the biohackers like Dave uh, Asprey and uh, Ben Greenfield, Luke Story to uh, even uh, Center of Innovative Medicine, the New York Center of Inno Innovative Medicine. We did a great podcast with them. That's more of a professional place where people are going for specific issues that they're dealing with. That's, uh, you know, um, a great location, but they're going to be a little bit more expensive, but, uh, it's, a uh, it's, a, a, a great device to really have, uh, whether it's in your home or in your business practices. No, it is. I, you know, I just, the, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, the, the idea that, you know, somebody or a wellness center has like 20 different things, uh, 20 different devices and then the amount of capital they've got locked up into all that stuff. And then now because of what you developed, you know, there's a, there's this great opportunity to literally reduce the capital expense because there's so much more this one device can do. I just, that's what really appealed, uh, was appealing to me about, about the biocharger. Uh, and then just, I just really wanted to know more about uh, the, the device from a specification standpoint uh, and to like, what could it really do uh, from that specific standpoint? Uh, I guess sure. to your point, though, you have lots of testimonials on your site uh, for if you want to see like what people are saying about it, as well as, you know, I encourage everyone just, you know, if you want to know what the benefits of PEMF is or what you want the benefits of electrotherapy is, you know, if you just go to Google Scholar, you'll see all the studies so that, you know, the evidence is out there and the testimonies are out there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's very impressive. So, you know, you did a quite a remarkable job, Jim. Um, yeah, thank you. Can't, can't, well, you can't know, imagine just, like what you're going to come up with next. <laughs> yeah. Just to add one more thing on the, you know, as a business, you know, a lot of times when you're buying a product, it's just a one-to-one a -one type of situation. So yeah. to scale it, you know, a lot of times, especially if you're trying, you're trying to be a, a, a place where you're doing a su subscription model, you know, you have those peak, peak hours from seven to nine and four to six, where, you got the people going into work or coming home from work and, you know, God, if I had uh, six bio, six, six devices, I could deal with six different people. And, it, you know, and to scale that is a little trickier. Whereas with the biocharger, it's easy to scale into. So, you know, you can do two people, three people, four people up to six people sitting around it before you need to get the second one. And by that point, you're already, you know, in the money. So you could easily afford the second one. So, for that person that's trying to scale to get into it, this works out really well. Yeah, no, I I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, got so many more questions, but I know you got a hard stop uh, and I just want to just let you go uh, and just say, you know, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate your time. I, yeah. just, I just love the story of the biocharger and, uh, you know, and just the, the innovation you've brought to the market is pretty impressive. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And if you want to get hold of Jim, it's biocharger.com. And if you want to find me, tinkers.academy. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your time today, Jim. And uh, any parting words? Yeah, I, I think that, it, you know, it, it, like you said, you have more questions and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe maybe we could uh, take some time out. You know, we'll think about, see how the 
the response goes. And if we want to do a second uh, turn to the crank with it, I'd love to do it again because, you know, this was a different type of podcast and I truly appreciate uh, you know, having this opportunity with you because this was a little bit a different approach. You know, it was more of a, uh, I, I really felt that I got a lot more out of this as far as our connection with it, just because you and I have had very similar paths of curiosity. You know, you've seen a lot of things come and go. You've seen a, a lot of technology. And uh, um, I really appreciate give, having this opportunity to do what we did here. And uh, anytime you want to do it again, the, the, um, the opportunity or the doors always open and uh, I'd love to do uh, some more stuff with you. Ah, awesome. Thank you so much. I, hey, everybody, if you've got any questions, throw them in the comments of the video. I have lots of questions. So Jim, I'll probably take you up on that. Let me just, I'll yeah. put together yeah, the maybe next Maybe we could do a little uh, podcast type of thing where we open it up to, you know, we'll maybe do yeah. a quick uh, blast and, you know, let them bring in some questions or we have some pre, pre canned questions that we Ooh, get from our great idea. You know, listeners and things like that. Um, that you is. know, I'm all about education at the end of the day. That's really what my job is, is to help educate uh, and move the, you know, just this whole movement forward. You know, this, this isn't just about biocharger. And when you really look at the the market, it's a $4 trillion market, this alternative uh, uh, health and wellness market. And people are really beginning to wake up to see these alternatives. And, you know, once you start digging deeper into this, you know, there become more questions and, uh, you know, that's, what I love to do is share. No, that's a great idea. I would love to do that. Let me go ahead and set that up. I'll let you know. Awesome. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, you know, because I didn't even get a chance to talk to you about scalar and the different frequencies and ah, uh, you know. Anyway, but hey, I know you got to run. So thank you so much, Jim. Really have a great yeah, thank day. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, me too. All right. Take care. Yep. Thanks.